Welcome you back to the Patrick Netherton Show right here on 1130 The Tiger. He's Rogers. I'm Patrick, and we are pleased to welcome in one of the smoothest. Rogers, this, you know, Kevin Eschenfelder is so handsome, it kind of makes me mad. Because that is one handsome dude out there on your on your television, and he's also good at what he does. It's really unfair, you know. I'm I'm I think I'm good at what I do, but I'm ugly. You know, Eschenfelder's out there. He's not only is he great, but he's also a good looking human being and a great dude to uh, to boot. Kevin Eschenfelder, pregame and postgame host on uh, AT and T Sportsnet for the Houston Astros. Esh, what's up, brother? Hey man, I'm glad you uh, glad they faxed over the, uh, the proper introduction. For yeah, me. yeah, no, it, it, <laughs> we, yeah, we got it in the fax machine that we had to dig out from the storage closet. But I, I do appreciate you uh, using the new technology. Hey, um, after last night, it, it does it feel like a reset of the series? Is it is it a relief? Kind of, what's the overall feeling in Houston after uh, the Astros got it done last night? Uh, you know, obviously it's a relief that you you know you don't want to go down 0-2. Uh, but they have been there and done that before. Uh, you know, they lost. They, they lost. They split the first two games with Boston, and uh, I don't think if there's one thing unique about this Astros team, obviously it's a great offensive team. And you know, whenever you've got a batting champion hitting seventh in your lineup, it, it's kind of it's kind of special. But uh, they don't panic, and I mean, they really they've been there and done that. And I have never. I was in Chicago with them with the White Sox, and man, it was. That was about as hostile environment as you're ever going to find. Boston was probably right there as well. Uh, they just don't they don't blink. And uh, so, you know, how this series turns out, who knows? But I will tell you this: there's absolutely there was zero panic after losing Game One, and of course, obviously, you're relieved to uh, get that win over Game Two. And I'm speaking for what I think is the the players, fans. Obviously, it's always going to be a little bit more of a you know, uh, a little bit more of an extreme. The, the, the players are going to be a little bit more even keel. It feels like uh, to me, Ash, that this this is one of those whichever starter has the best outing. I think all of these. It feels like all of these games are going to end up kind of being similar to each other. Uh, in that they're sort of opposites, right? I mean, the, this this was kind of the same way that that game one went, except for the Braves. They got a better starting outing. Um, and then, you know, they get up 5 six, t- one, six, two, that kind of thing. Astros do the same thing in, in for you know on their side yes- yesterday. With neither team having a, a quote-unquote ace on their staff, does that kind of feel like, hey, whoever, whichever starter goes out there and gives them the best performance is probably the team that has the best chance to win? Uh, you know what? I would, I would argue just the opposite. Okay. I would argue whoever has the best uh, bullpen is going to have the best chance to win because – uh, I'm not sure how much you're going to get out of your starters, and of course, obviously, you know you go if you get a starter in this series with McCullers out now, with obviously with Charlie Morton out, you get a starter that's going to give you six innings. If you get a starter give you six innings any time in a postseason game, uh, you're you're more than likely going to win the game uh, just because that's the way it's managed now. Because as soon as the guy gets in trouble, boom, you go to the bullpen, and that's what you start doing. But yeah, I, I would say that the to me, and that's why the Astros are where they are. One of the big reasons is how good the bullpen has been. Uh, once again, last night, scoreless outing from the bullpen. Uh, so I, I could say, I, I see your point. Yeah. But I could just, I could, I could argue 180 degrees, just the opposite as far as, you know, whoever has the better bullpen is the one that's going to, because that's what we're, that's what teams rely on once it starts to get to the postseason. Well, the reason I said that is because, at least in the first two games of this series, the team that had the better starter, the the other team is the one that jumped out, right? Astro, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Atlanta got up a, a early. In game one, Astros got up big in game two early because the starters were were not, you know, Freed gives up six earned, uh, you know, and, and you turn around and Fromber Valdez is giving up a bunch of runs early. It feels yep. like that, that, you know, if your starter isn't sharp early, the, the opposing offenses are good enough, they're going to jump on you, and then it doesn't matter how good your bullpen is uh, because if you're down six to two or five to one or whatever the case may be, I feel like it's hard to catch. It's going to be hard to catch either of these teams from behind. Yeah, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see too, though. Is that how? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure that uh, anybody's going to give their starter a chance to from here on out to let their team get down. Uh, you know, five five runs in a, in a game. So mm-hmm. you know, it, it's either way. I mean, there's no wrong answers as far as that's concerned. It's the it's the World Series. It's postseason baseball, and uh, you know, it's 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 managed different. I don't I don't think there's any sport that the postseason is more different than the regular season than major league baseball. There's no doubt to me about that, but just the whole way it's managed, it's, it's different. You know, you don't, you're not, 
you're not playing for tomorrow because you don't know if you have tomorrow. Right. When it comes to the postseason. So. That being said, I mean, even in the regular season, where it's not like we're seeing guys go out there and just throw CGs up left and right. I mean, it's just not the how baseball's played anymore. You know, you're, you're a guy that's been around the sport for a long, long time. Is it weird to watch a manager pull a guy like, I mean, Urquidy last night, right? Not like he was in a ton of trouble or anything. Uh, he just you know, he gave us five. It's time to go get the bullpen. Uh, are you, is that still sort of jarring to you or, or because you've watched it now for, for so many years, you kind of are used to the idea that, hey, even if this guy is, is not really in trouble, we're going to go get him because we're, the bullpen's set up and ready to go for the last four innings or whatever. I, I think that's part of it. And they also know that they can set up their bullpen against pockets, meaning, you know, if you've got your, your, your A guy, that, uh, you know, you got seven, eight, nine coming up in the order. Well, maybe you'll go to your B guy instead of, uh, you know, see what I'm saying? So you can kind of match Well, up they did that last night. The after that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, did Presley, in, in Presley eighth, came in in the eighth and then Graveman through the ninth, even though Presley's technically the closer. But but to your question, you know, as far as the – I'm so used to it. That's just the way the game is played now. It's yeah. Not, you know, if, if you go out and see a guy go give you eight innings, man, that's – that's uh, probably going to be the best game he's pitched. He pitches all season long. It's just the way that the game is. You know, it's it's a it's an evolution because it doesn't just start at the major league level. It starts at the minor league level, and they have so much money. We know this. They have so much money invested in these these players that they they're going to protect them at all costs and uh, protect those arms. And and for the Astros, I mean, they've got guys that you know they got guys that haven't pitched that many innings. I mean, Luis Garcia will go to the mound tomorrow night. People forget Luis Garcia before 2020, and if it hadn't been 2020 and as weird as everything was, Luis Garcia probably wouldn't have pitched in the big leagues. But this is a guy that had never pitched above a ball, and you know he's pitching he's pitching in the big leagues in 2020 because there was they just had so many injuries and it was just such a strange strange year. Obviously, it was a great thing because it showed the depth of the organization because he's been fantastic. But they're also they're, they're watching those numbers as far as the innings pitch. Mm-hmm going from once and it's it's not okay he threw he threw 180 innings it's, well he threw 180 innings after only never throwing more than x amount you know what i mean yeah and, uh ever throwing more than 120 they only threw you know 78 last year so they're, they don't want that big jump yeah it, it, gone are the days when when guys are out there you know 130 pitches like that just doesn't happen anymore and, and look rightfully so right you're they're they're being a lot more cautious with with guys arms uh, but at the same time, for a, you know, for a, uh, I don't want to say I'm a purist, but a guy that, that, you know, grew up watching games a certain way. And I was, I was a huge Braves fan back in the 90s. I mean, if, if Bobby Cox had tried to come get uh, Glavin or Smoltz or Maddox <laughs> in the fifth inning, he'd have gotten punched. I mean, it just, there's no two ways about it. So it's, for me, it's still a little jarring to watch starters be like, okay, well, I got you five or four or whatever. I'm going to go sit down and, and uh, you know, take the rest of them. I don't know. It just – it still feels weird to me, Ash. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Well, you know, you know, it should feel weird. It doesn't feel weird to you because you were used to it. But you got to go watch uh, every fifth day, watch a Hall of Famer pitch for uh, three, day, you know, three times through the, through the rotation. And not, not everybody gets that luxury. But, True. Uh, you know, that was something that was – Obviously, very good if you were a Braves fan in 1990. Is uh, is it safe to say? And I, and I don't, you know, you obviously didn't didn't Jordan deserve the the ALCS MVP, but is it safe to say that if Houston does end up winning the World Series, that Framber Valdez's start, his second start in the ALCS, may be the biggest start of the season for for Houston? Yeah, I I, I do think. Well, at least. Until the next biggest start, right, <laughs> right. Which would be down the road. Yeah, but he was just fantastic. And that's Fromber. I mean, he's been he's been consistent up until the postseason. Obviously, he wasn't good in Game One. He wasn't good in, in you know when he pitched in the ALCS until he was. And then when he was, he was great. And uh, they needed him in a big way. So, uh, you know, it's all about to me it's, with with Fromber. It's all about command when he's when he's landing that breaking ball. My goodness. He's special, and that's something I'm going to be looking at for Luis Garcia tomorrow night too, because you know he's pitching on a couple of extra days rest, and uh, so see how it plays out for him, and uh, see how his command is, because you know he's going to be hyped up a little bit. I will say this: those guys, even the young guys, uh, Urquidy, Luis Garcia, these are just you know what 24 year old guys. Yeah, they uh, they are very they're slow heart rate guys, and uh, so it's. To stage won't. I don't know how it's going to play out, but I promise you, if it doesn't play out well, it won't be because the stage was too big. No doubt about it. Talking to Kevin Eschenfelder, pre and post game host for the Houston Astros, AT and T Sportsnet anchor. Um, offensively, obviously, the Astros are are fantastic. You mentioned 
you've got a, a guy, you know, the AL batting champ who's batting seventh, which is is pretty wild. But uh, when you when you look at a guy like Jose Altuve, he's he's my favorite player in Major League Baseball because a guy that size to do what he does. Uh, is there a more sort of heart and soul type player for a team than than Altuve to the Astros? I I can't think of one off the top of my head. And it, you know, it's obviously, uh, you know, I'm biased because it's, sure. I, I love Jose Altuve. He's he's a the people don't understand that the, what he has gone through and all the you know. I mean, I was there in Chicago, and it's just it's brutal. And uh, you know, and the, you know, the whole other discussion about but to be able to survive and to be able to be so great in such hostile environments that, that, that it's, it's amazing what he's been able to do. And, and uh, to tell you what, if people, <laughs> I think about those people and what they say in the stands, if they knew Jose Altuve, they would, they would be amazed because he's a fantastic person. And uh, he's one of, he's, he's the kind of guy that if you, you know, if, if you wanted to pick somebody to, uh, to cheer for, he would be the guy. I can promise you that. Also, uh, Jordan Alvarez's maturity is something that that really impresses me because he's a guy that, you know, you get a lot of, of of young hitters that show up, and I know he's not that young, but you know, young in terms of major league experience, you get a lot of guys that show up there, and it's hey, I'm pulling everything, but his ability to take the outside pitch and go the other way, and his willingness to do it over and over again, that's a special special hitter uh, because not a lot of guys have that sort of patience. Well, I I think what happens with people is they see him is this monstrous man, you know, that gets into the batter's box and they automatically think, you know, light tower power. He has light tower power. He is a fantastic hitter. Uh, that's the thing that people don't get. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, you, you're, you're looking at his numbers in, in July and the guys, you know, sitting 295. It's not just a matter of going out. He's not one of these guys that goes out and hits 30 home runs and hits 215. Right. This is this guy is a fantastic hitter. And that's a, that's a big reason why. I mean, he, he doesn't, he has no, you pitch him away. He'll go away. It does, it's fine, and and he'll also hit the ball 400 feet, you know, to uh, to left center field yeah. too. And uh, that's the thing that's amazing. He's he has got tremendous power, but he is a fantastic hitter. And I think people that don't watch him on a day to day basis they don't quite realize that because you you see the big man and you think you know huge power, but uh, he's not a big strikeout guy. Uh, he does have power, but he's also you know. Doubles. Hey, he's got two triples in the yeah, postseason. No doubt. Yeah, there you go. And hey. he can fly. That's the thing too. Yes. People think he's this lumbering. This dude can. I'm telling you, it's like Shohei Otani a little bit. He's not as fast as Otani, but people don't understand how fast Otani is because Otani's a massive man too. But I'm telling you, Jordan Alvarez can flat out get up and down. I mean, he can he can pick him up and put him down. He's fast. I'm uh I'm gonna say something to you that I'm pretty sure no one's ever said to you in in your life. Or mine, and that is uh, Jordan Alvarez reminds me a little bit of me uh, in that in that when I used to play uh, intramural softball back in college, I would I would get up to the plate and I would take the biggest hacks of you know pr- get practice swings. I'm taking and the outfielders would just start backing up, and of course we didn't have fences, so the outfielders just start backing up. And Esh, every single time I would I would just dink one right over the third baseman's head, and I'd have a double because the outfielders were playing 900 feet. Uh, so you know. I at least looked intimidating when I was that at the was, plate. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I understand. It was it announced your presence with authority. Until it, you, exactly, and then I out. and then I basically bunted it over the third baseman's head to uh, to get hey, on board. You're a run producer. No, He's hey, fast. look, I'm I, all I my my OB uh, o, OPS was probably sky high. I can't even imagine what it would have been. <laughs> hey, uh, last thing, any chance you think that the Astros are able to keep Correa after this year? I think there's a chance. Uh, I don't know how. I mean, yeah, there's a chance. There's uh, and as people say, well, what would you? He's going to get this money. You're right, and then he's going to get Buku's money. This would be my, and I've told people this. This would be my meeting with Carlos Correa. Is outside the left field wall at Minute Maid Park. There is a statue of Craig Biggio throwing to a stretched Jeff Bagwell at first base. I would say. There's no place. Yeah, you know, there's other places where you may make more money, but there's you stay here, and you and Jose Altuve will have statues out in that out right out there. Nowhere else will that happen. You can go wherever you want to go. You can make more money, but you will be an absolute baseball god and own this city if you stay here. Now, will that make any difference? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, 
Carlos Correa is an unbelievably intelligent man. Yeah. So who knows? Who knows? Maybe the, maybe that means something to him, and I can't. I'll, and if it doesn't, I don't blame him. I would, you know, hey, you you go you go do what's best for you, and God bless you, and thank you for every all every postseason memory and regular season memory because I'm a big Carlos Correa fan. He, uh, I think he could buy a statue if he really wanted to. That, that with really with whatever with whatever money he's going to end up making at, in this off season, nope. I think he could go buy Absolutely. his own statue. Well, that's true. He'll be able to buy maybe on buy his own team. So yeah, <laughs> maybe so. Hey, Ash, you're the best, my friend. Hey, I, I know the Rockets are are kind of getting started. Any any news with them? I know they're kind of young and and starting over and a bit of a new roster. What uh, what news do you have of the Rockets early on? Yeah, yeah. I'm getting as a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to go see them play Utah tonight. I'm getting ready to go to the Toyota Center right now. Uh, they, uh, yeah, they're young. They're going to make a lot of mistakes. They're going to turn the ball over a lot, and they're going to do just fantastic things because they're so talented. So it's going to be a mixed bag. It's going to be a work in progress. You know, you, you draft four, uh, four 19-year-olds, and uh, it's what the NBA is. But Jalen Green is special. Uh, Devin Porter Jr. has a chance to be. So, yeah, they're going to be okay, but it's going to be a while. Now let me tell you how I'm like the Houston Rockets. Okay. I'm <laughs> I also am turnover prone and make a lot of mistakes. The difference is I don't have any of the good stuff that comes on the other side. Ash, you're the best, my friend. Thank you so much for carving out a little time for us, brother, and uh, best of luck to your Strohs and your Rockets. All right, Pat. Thanks, man. All right. Kevin Eschenfelder, good dude, man, and a a hell of a broadcaster while he's at it. So good to have him and talk a little Houston sports. Makes Rogers. 